And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindred and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. God's placed me here tonight to warn of the coming hour of persecution. The Holy Spirit is my witness. This convention tonight is being warned here and now of an intense hour of persecution for all spirit-filled believers. Here to prepare, to be hated, rejected, maligned, and ridiculed. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. Practice Christianity and you could be court-martialed. You'll go down as the greatest bigots and haters of mankind in history. Some of us Christians may actually lose our lives in the coming days for our faith. Christianity in Mosul is dead, and a Christian holocaust is in our midst. Seven weeks ago, we went to Washington, D.C., and we were calling this a Christian genocide. Spirit, 
It's part of me tonight to go into detail and share with you what I see coming in the way of persecution. Now, it was Jesus himself who told us to tarry for a Pentecost. Jesus himself told us the Holy Ghost would fall upon us. Jesus himself promised us power from on high. But it was also Jesus Christ himself who predicted persecution was coming for all true spirit baptized believers. Jesus predicted it. John 15, 19. Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of this world, that I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world will hate you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And here is another one. The brother shall deliver up the brother to death, the father the child. Children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endure to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, Run to another, because I tell you, you will not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he fears his master. Now the purpose of this coming persecution that I see in the Spirit will be to separate and scatter the true believers from the false. Time is running out, and the gospel still has to be preached to all nations before Jesus comes. Now the Holy Ghost has been poured out upon thousands, but just as in the early Pentecostal outpouring, disciples still sit around singing and rejoicing and sharing only with each other. Among us are still those who talk in tongues and still live like the devil. But he's going to lay the axe to the root. He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's going to scatter his seed to the far corners of the earth. And God's word will be fulfilled. Second Timothy 3.12 all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You quote the scripture, they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. They shall speak with tongues. Go all the way if you're going to be a charismatic Christian. Read it all, accept it. All, 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 a double L L. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now let me share with you what the Holy Spirit's revealed to me in vision concerning this persecution. Number one, it's going to come as a persecution madness on the earth. I see now persecution coming such as mankind has never before witnessed. This will be a persecution of true Jesus, Jesus believers, and it's going to rise like a many-headed monster out of the sea. It'll start slowly, subtly, coming at a time when religious freedom appears to be at a peak. But it's going to spread the United States, Canada, the entire world, and finally become a kind of madness. That madness is already upon us. The Antichrist spirit is entering the hearts of certain men in high places already. Government, in the judicial system, and it's led to a spiritual wickedness in high places. And this spiritual wickedness in high places will eventually and soon lead to an harassment, not only of officials, but those in churches, missionaries, and ministers. There's already evidence of this harassment. I see a time coming when nearly all evangelical missionary projects, all religious radio and television programming, all incorporated missionary societies are going to be so closely monitored, questioned, and badgered by government agencies, they'll be cautious and worried about moving or expanding in any direction. Number two, I see rising a super world church. I see the formation of a super world church council consisting of a union between liberal ecumenical Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church, joining politically hand in hand to create one of the most powerful religious forces on earth. And this union is going to start as a cooperative charities program and it will end in a political union. This visible super world church is going to be spiritual in name only, freely using the name of Jesus Christ but will in fact be anti-Christ and political in many of its activities. This powerful church union will be deeply involved in social action, tremendous charity programs and ministries of compassion. Its leaders will make statements about meeting human need. They'll send out a call for social action, political intervention, and a greater voice in world affairs. 
There's going to be, fourthly, a sudden mysterious chain of events. Just when it appears the ecumenical movement is nearly dead, a rather mysterious chain of events will bring about the framework for this union. Rome is going to insist upon and receive concessions from the Protestant ecumenical leaders. The Pope will be considered more of a political rather than a spiritual leader of this church union. Protestant leaders of the ecumenical movement are going to insist upon and receive concessions from Rome. Protestants will not be asked to consider the Holy Father as the infallible head of the church. They accept his political leadership without accepting his role as Peter's successor. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Pope or any of these church leaders involved in the super church will be engaging in antichrist activity. The Bible talks about something about that line, but I can't get into it now. The Bible, as far as I'm concerned, though, I see something that frightens me to the very core of my soul. I see an army of career people invading the most influential post in the super church. They're going to be ungodly anti-Christ people obsessed with the idea that this super church must become a big political power, strong enough to defeat anybody who opposes its actions. And while those that are in leadership are speaking about miracles and love and reconciliation, these hirelings who work under them are going to be harassing and persecuting every religious organization that does not come under their leadership. Fourthly, I see homosexuals and lesbians welcome to the super church union. I see this super world church in the guise of, mis of understanding, accepting homosexuals and lesbians into its fellowship. Homosexuals and homosexual and lesbian love will be vindicated by the leadership of this church union. Homosexuals will not only be welcomed, but they'll be encouraged to continue in their practices. Homosexual and le lesbian ministers will not only be ordained and given places of authority, They'll be heralded as a new breed of pioneer evangelists introducing new concepts of love and evangelism. I see in nearly every major city in the United States and around the world, homosexual churches catering exclusively to the spiritual needs of their own kind with full recognition from organized religion. Their Sunday school and church literature distributed to their children will suggest to teenagers that homosexuality is a normal and acceptable form of Christian practice. New dancing in the church. New dancing in some of these member churches will be excused as an artistic form of worship. Men are going to become worshippers of the creature more than the Creator. And God will be forced to give these kind of worshippers over to their sins. And as a result, many will be given over to reprobate minds creating a new form of mental illness that will not respond to any kind of treatment. Now, God will not let that go unanswered. And although new dancing will not become widespread, it's going to be accepted by many church leaders in the future as a legitimate expression of worship. Next, occult practices within this church. I believe this super world church will condone certain occult practices. They'll set up study committees to defang the devil and remake his image into one of a non-entity, bland, someone not to be feared. Now, in some of the most respected, wealthy churches in America, seances will replace prayer meetings, and that's already happening. More and more ministers are going to be intrigued by the supernatural claims of the spiritualist and Satanist groups. And I see the day coming when certain ministers who've never been too close to Jesus will get very close to the devil. Satan is going to appear as an angel of light to deceive if it were possibly the elect, the chosen of God. Satan's own ministers will appear as these angels and they'll try to spread the message within the church that the enemy, Satan, is not to be feared. The super church will never officially accept the occult practices outright, but phonology, palmistry, Fortune telling and horoscopes will be widely respected and accepted. Now, listen closely. Next, I see the rise of another super church, a supernatural, invisible church, a union of deeply spiritual followers of Jesus Christ, bound together through the Holy Spirit, mutual confidence in Christ and His Word. The supernatural church of true believers will become a kind of underground church and will include Catholics and Protestants of all denominations, 
young and old, black and white, and people of all nations. And while this visible super world church gains political power, this invisible body of believers will grow tremendously in spiritual power. This power will come from persecution. The persecution madness that's coming upon this earth will drive these Christians closer together and closer to Jesus Christ. There will be less concern about denominational ties and more concern and emphasis on the coming of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will bring together in one all people of all faiths and walks of life. And although this supernatural church already exists around the world, in the days coming soon, it will become politically almost invisible. It will not speak out much on social issues, but as persecution becomes more intense, this body of true believers will become almost radical in its evangelistic efforts, and in this invisible church, will receive supernatural unction and Holy Ghost power to preach the gospel to the four corners of the earth. Next, persecution for charismatic Catholics. And this makes me tremble, and I've fought with the Lord for three weeks now, saying, I can't say it. The Lord said, you say it. Charismatic Catholics who consider themselves members of the invisible supernatural church of Jesus Christ face the most grievous hour of persecution of all. The Roman Catholic Church, I predict in the spirit, is about to pull in the welcome mat to all Catholics who speak with tongues and who lean toward the Pentecostal teachings concerning the Holy Spirit. High level political pressure will be placed on priests and local level to put the fire out. Watch for the Pope to take a negative stand against the charismatic movement within the Catholic Church. The honeymoon is about over. Catholic magazines will soon begin to speak out against the movement within its ranks and call for a purging. It will begin as a very slow trend, but will gather quick momentum until all Catholics in this movement will eventually face real persecution from within their own church. The charismatic movement within the Catholic Church will become so powerful and widespread, it will appear to some leaders as a threat to those who don't understand what it means. I see more than 500,000 involved in the Catholic Charis movement, charismatic movement within a short time. And those not in the movement will accuse it of lacking social concern and being too oblivious to the traditions of the church. They'll be accused of turning away from the Virgin Mary and negating the authority of the Pope. And that every charismatic Catholic who boasts about a baptism of the Holy Ghost prepare for persecution. It's not going to happen overnight, but most assuredly the day is coming when every single Catholic who's experienced a spiritual awakening will have to understand where his loyalties are. Some will be forced to return to tradition and allow the experience to be frozen. Many others, however, will soon discover that they have more Christian love, fellowship, and spiritual rapport with other spiritual Protestants and Catholics who have now centered their lives around the person of Jesus Christ, the fullness of the Holy Ghost, and his soon return. Many will not believe me, but I see the day when Catholics, Lutherans, and many others of all denominations are going to have to come out from among them. These new Christians will not call themselves Protestant or Catholic, but simply renewed Christians. Their fellowship will not be based Their fellowship will not be based on the experience of speaking with tongues, but will be centered on the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That is our fellowship. Number nine, I see a persecution through a media struggle. There is at present tremendous freedom for preaching the gospel on radio and television. Never the door has been more open to minister Christ in the media. Christians even own and operate their own radio and TV stations. They're at liberty to pray for the sick, raise money, and promote the gospel in any way they see fit. But watch out. Persecution and harassment is already beginning. There's a sound of change in the air. Christ-centered radio and TV programming will become the target of satanic forces determined to force every one of them off the airwaves. 
already there's a behind the scenes movement to establish a kind of rating system for all religious radio and TV programming. And the liberal leaders of this super church council will soon attempt to establish a kind of screening board and force themselves on the FCC as the final authority on all paid and sustaining religion on the media. They want no program to be aired without their approval. The doors that are now wide open are slowly but surely going to close. Christian radio and TV stations should begin to expect persecution harassment. Atheistic and anti-Christ forces are even now preparing litigation against certain religious stations. And I see Satan trying to bog down these programs and stations in red tape, legal proceedings and tax problems. And Satan will use every tactic at his disposal to remove all Christ-centered programs from the media. And the message I have for all of you who minister in the media is this from the Holy Spirit. Work while it is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. And that's a message for the media. Persecution from Hollywood. Watch for Hollywood to step up its attack against two religions with more expose-type films. The film Marjo was the most brazen attempt by the devil to put down and ridicule all religion having to do with the blood of Jesus Christ. Never in American history was it done before. Revivalists and evangelical ministers are going to be stereotyped as Elmer Gantries, charlatans, cheats, money-mad comedians. More and more movie makers are going to attempt to debunk our morals. Gospel preaching churches and ministers are going to come under special attack, while at the same time the occult and witchcraft will be glorified and sensationalized. Next, persecution from television comedies. TV comedy shows, the Holy Spirit has told me, will become bolder and bolder and will poke fun at Christ and all true Christians. Comedy writers are going to strike out blow after blow designed to put down sacred traditions. And eventually these shows will be punctuated with four-letter words and anything will go on television. Television programmers will become absolutely blasphemous. And millions and millions of unbelievers will sit in front of their TV sets laughing and mocking as subjects once considered sacred are on their mind and mocked and ridiculed. And last night on the Today Show, it was brought home so vividly as impressionist David Fry maliciously mocked Billy Graham as a money raiser and a money grabber. Made my blood boil. Marjo sat there knocking all Roberts and Billy Graham and it came home to me so hard. David, this is just the beginning. Talk shows everywhere, movies, theaters, debunking Christ in his blood and glorifying the devil. And my message to you Jesus people today is loud and clear. Get ready to be persecuted. Prepare to face these hate Christ clubs in your schools. In many places, Christian young people who take an open stand for Christ will be verbally stoned by those their own age. This revulsion movement against Christ is going to be personally directed by the devil himself and carried out by those who are committed to his worship. Jesus' people are going to be not only considered freaks, they're going to be called all manner of names, they're going to be spat upon in the quarters of high schools and college campuses. And the day will come when Bibles will be plucked from their arms and ripped apart by a laughing crowd of mockers. The harassment's going to eventually become so violent and widespread that Christian young people will either harden themselves like steel and stand up and witness against it or crumble before it and deny their faith. And this is what persecution is all about. I see coming also a spiritual awakening behind the iron and bamboo curtains. While the free nations are experiencing this wave of persecution, the iron and bamboo curtain countries will experience a short period of spiritual awakening. Those who have lived under religious, terrible religious persecution are going to enjoy a limited time of freedom. God's Holy Spirit is going to split the iron and bamboo curtains and he's going to seek out and find hungry hearts in Russia and China and Eastern Europe, no doubt about it. God's promised to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. He did not exclude these nations. God is bringing to pass a temporary truce between the East and the West, 
for the express purpose of getting the gospel into these communist countries, Japanese and Korean Christians will be used of God to reach thousands in China. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in West Germany is to reach through to East Germany. The outpouring that's taken place in Finland now is destined to spread through northern Russia. A tremendous move of the Holy Spirit. Ironically, while the doors are beginning to close on this side of the curtain, the doors will open on the other, and after a short period of freedom and spiritual awakening, the doors will suddenly close and those nations cast into horrible persecution. And I see it clearly. I see a gossip war. I know now that Satan has declared war on every true minister of Jesus Christ. He's going to leave no stone unturned in his attempt to discredit and shipwreck every man of God who's determined to stay true. Those ministers and priests who refuse to cheat on their wives, they refuse to indulge in the freedom of the new morality, they're going to be the target of the most vicious, vicious, malicious gossip of all times. The devil is going to raise up gossip mongers to harass and malign and lie against you. There will be innuendos, lies, false statements that will float around that come from the very pits of hell. It will be a supernatural demonstration of demonic power. There will not be a single true minister of the gospel immune. And the wives, hear me now, the wives of those ministers who are married are also going to come under the attack of malicious gossip. Legions of lying spirits have been turned loose upon the world with the single purpose of accusing Christians through gossip and slander to rob them of their victory and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This gossip war will not only be aimed against ministers, but against every true spirit filled believer of Jesus Christ. Even the teenagers are going to see what it's like to face malicious gossip. The ends of the world have come upon us. And I've always been a positive preacher. I've never preached much about judgment. But my friend, you can't talk about the coming of Jesus Christ until you open your eyes and see that all that's happening around us now, the Lord is saying, look up when you see these things begin to happen and rejoice because your redemption draws nigh. And I bring you to my final word. How can the Christian remain sane? How can he keep his fortitude? How can he be objective? How can he be rational in an age that's falling apart? Lord, where do we stand now? And dear friend, you've got to hear what the Holy Spirit said to me. Just five little words. But so powerful, they awakened in me a glorious new hope and faith, and I woke up shouting. And those five little words that blazed in my heart were these. God has everything under control. Hallelujah. This is what I got. All of nature is under control. We hear earthquakes, famines, pestilence, hailstorms, killer heat waves, floods, drastic weather changes are breaking all past records. It looks like nature's out of control, but God's word is clearly predicted it would happen. The wrath of God is to be outpoured on this earth through an unleashed fury of nature because God is warning mankind that judgment is coming and these are labor pains and the closer we get to the birth of his kingdom more frequent and intensive we'll get until the birth of the kingdom of God. And it was God who told Job that he shut up the sea with doors. The sea can't cross the door. He set bars and doors to stay the proud waves. God said he took hold of the ends of the earth that the wicked might be shaken out of it, reserved 
the treasures of hail and snow against the day of battle. He's divided the water courses for the overflow of the waters, that's the flood. He set the domain of the earth and the ordinances of the heaven. He sends forth lightnings and he scatters the wind upon the earth. Who does it? God does it, child of God. In these days to come, the Holy Spirit would say to you, don't fear the fury of nature. God is still king of the flood. And you look upon those floods, earthquakes, and hurricanes, and you say to yourself, that's my God talking. He's calling, he's chastising, and he's saying, get ready. Even the devil is under his control. As with Job, God may permit him to touch every material, physical thing around you, but you hear it? Satan cannot possess you or rob you of your faith in God. The devil's power is limited, and the Bible said even a baby Christian can put him to flight simply by resisting him to the Word and the blood. The Bible said resist the devil and he will flee from you. Does that sound like defeat? Does that suggest a victorious devil? Never. God has everything under control, and we are under his control, so we are not afraid of the devil. It is the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom, and God's message is this. I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. You and I and everything that touches us is now under his control. No matter how things look in this drunken world, all things are still working together to everyone who loves God and called according to his purpose. All right, let the dollar fail. Let the depression and recession come. Let there be unemployment and pollution and inflation and wars and rumors of war. Let the fabric of society disintegrate. For the true child of God, everything is under control. It doesn't matter. Nothing can harm you. He said, look up and rejoice and be happy. And in closing, the future is under his control. God has everything pre-programmed. He knows the exact moment that Christ will return. The final tribulation, the judgments, the battle of Armageddon are all on his calendar, and he's blocking them off one at a time. And the God who controls all of heaven and earth says to us, Christian, spirit-filled, the nations, or as a drop of a bucket, and they're counted as small dust in my balance. <laughs> the nations of the world are just a drop in a bucket. All nations are as nothing before me. They are less than nothing. Don't worry about worldly powers. I've got it all programmed. God is still counting the hairs on our head. He's still counting the sparrows that fall. He's still hearing petitions before they're asked. He's still answering before being called. He's given abundantly more now than we could ever ask or think. So saints of God, wake up. He's still saving and healing and baptizing and is getting his house in order. And the fear is to blaspheme. And now you can go over tonight and go to sleep and say to your heart, God has everything under control. Hallelujah.